Hello there, Emmett Ryan from Ball in Europe here, and uh, as you can see, I'm not in an arena, I'm not in a pub, I'm not at anything to do with basketball. I'm here to answer your questions about Eurobasket, and thank you all for sending in your cues. It's been great to get them, and I'm going to answer a few questions there, mostly about Eurobasket. There's a couple that aren't, and I'm going to read off the list I've got here from a few of you that sent them in. Most of you sent in more than one, which is great because uh, that means I've got way more to talk about. So, uh, let's start from the start. I jumbled these around a bit, so don't worry if you've got more than one. I'm going to get through all of them. And the first one is from Moshe Barda, a good friend of mine, obviously from Israel, Sweet 16 podcast with me. And Moshe has a very simple question. We're starting off on a negative one. Who's the disappointment of Eurobasket 22? Or 2022, whichever you want to say. And, uh, I mean, it's a pretty easy one for me, Team GB. It's not the player's fault. I've got a long piece explaining why. You can see that in the corner there. and Or maybe it's the corner there. I'm not sure which way to point, by the way, uh, when I'm looking at this. But one of the corners will have the link there, or will have just had it for you there. But uh, yeah, like structurally, they clearly just aren't in a position where they are fielding what Britain should be fielding as a national team. As an Irish guy, like <sighs> this reminds me of following the English cricket team of all things in the 90s. Uh, which is going to come up again, by the way, with my last question. And uh, it's that they were so bad you couldn't root against them, and you want to be able to root against your neighbour if you don't get along with them. And historically, we don't get along with the English. I've got lots of British friends, love the UK, but you want to be able to root against them in sports. GB right now, not good enough to root against lads, and you shouldn't be doing that. Like, you know, that's my unbiased, that's my biased side, obviously. The journalists are covered in an unbiased fashion. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it there. And in fairness, I was like rooting for you in the 2012 Olympics because you had Rachel Vanderbilt playing for your women. I'm like, sure, she was playing in Limerick at the time. So, of course, I was rooting for you. Anywho, so that's that one. GB, sorry, you're the disappointment. Question number two. Big stars aside, what player has been the biggest revelation? That's from Lewis uh, Cameron, and he's also from the Sweet 16 podcast. Um, so, well, Lewis, I'm going to stick with the group I saw, which is Group C in Milan, because I didn't know a whole lot about Issa Sanan going into this tournament. I now know he is an absolute joy to watch. He's going to be playing in the North Europe Best Basketball League this year, I believe, and one of the FIBA club competitions. I'm not sure which one, and uh, with Promete. And I really want to. I mean, he's going to be a go-to streaming player. Like he's just so much fun. So definitely use of Sanan for that one. Has the four-year gap made it more meaningful for players and coaches? Which is a very interesting one, and it comes from a coach of the Irish women's national team, James Weldon. James, I will say yes, even though oddly we're doing like a five-year and a three-year gap because pandemic. Uh, but yeah, I think it's definitely become that because I, I think Eurobasket is standing on its own now. It's not seen as, well, it never was seen as entirely, but it's not like tied in directly to World Cup qualification or Olympic qualification. Like it has to stand on its own two feet entirely. Whereas before there was a little bit of a crutch there. Uh, like I'll never forget Kozlaukas, Kozlaukas, sorry, running in after Lithuania beat Serbia in the 2015 semi-final, like he had just gotten away with highway robbery, the smile on his face, like, you know, like Lithuania deserved to win that game, but like the expression was that, like just running through the mix zone, I was like, well, hey, pull that one off, boys. So like, yeah, that's, that, 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 and that was because they won a semi-final, you know, in the final, and that was, their ticket was punched to the Olympics uh, in Rio, and I was kind of going, yeah, that's great. Like, that was a wonderful moment at the time, but it's just kind of better because now it's just purely about winning the freaking thing. That's what it's about. So yeah, James, I'm going to say it is more meaning, meaningful for players and coaches. Would winning this be the biggest achievement of Coach Pezic's career? That's also in James Weldon. I'm going to bring two answers here. One, which I think is the honest, unbiased take, and the other, which I think would be Pezic's own take. For Pezic, I think it would be, because it is Serbian and it's for Serbia. And obviously, the personal emotional side, absolutely no question. And I would not argue with him if he said to me, this is the biggest achievement of, my, of his career. But I'm going back nearly 30 years because I think he's already, you know, surpassed what he could do with Serbia. And that was when he won it with Germany in 93, because to me that was like, you know, a much tougher task with that German side and he pulled it off. So I'm going to go with that. Why do some people call you Thunder? This is from Niall Gray, a journalist and commentator from the UK. Uh, Niall asked this sort of in another thread, so this is a weird one. I have played exactly one organised basketball game in my entire life. It was a media game at a EuroLeague Final Four, 
and um, I happened to have grown a ridiculous beard at the time and like also I need these I, I really need these glasses and I can't really run around on a court without them I've never worn contacts so I was wor uh, playing blind which added to my you know then mid slash late 30s unathleticism which is now my early 40s on athleticism didn't really help matters nor the whole way I'd never really played basketball properly before and I was playing some guys who played it on the reg still never mind when they were kids and yeah so like you know I got a photo of me with Sergio Scariolo at the end and I refer to like you know Scariolo having his biggest challenge yet coaching bearded thunder I just thought it was a funny nickname Moshe has run with this forever uh, Aris sort of short, Aris Barkas, Euro Hoops, uh, Cosmotes, and also the Sweet 16 podcast. Uh, Aris uh, sort of a bit to thunder. Uh, and yeah, no, I, I've grown, it's grown on me. Uh, some might say like a fungus, but I've actually learned to enjoy it. Like it isn't like a name that I get called outside the basketball community, which is one of the things I like about it. Like it's sort of, it's one of a thing for people in basketball. But yeah, no, that's kind of where it came from. So basically I had a ridiculous beard. I ended up going to Cannes with that beard. I don't know where I may find it on the internet someday there are photos of me in a tux with this stupid beard wildly overgrown hair that was sort of a send off the red carpet in Cannes uh, went to see Personal Shopper the Kristen Stewart movie it, it, she's very good in it it's not very good it's how I best describe the movie so there was a tangent for you oh here's the one all the Greeks wanted here and the Slovenians and the Serbians and maybe the Germans and uh, maybe one or two others who will be MVP? That's from Moshe Barda again. Moshe, okay, so for me, MVP, there's two things to bear in mind. One, who I'm going to vote for, and two, who's going to win. More often than not, who I vote for is also who wins. There was one occasion where I felt they weren't going to, that they won it anyway, and that occasion was 2015. So after the quarterfinals, I had decided, having seen so much of all the teams, mostly because of what he had done to carry his team, pure hero stuff. I know this is the quarters of the semis. Pau Gasol uh, in that quarterfinal uh, run, which eventually became a win. I thought by that stage, through the first seven games of Eurobasket, with you know the maximum number of games he was going to play was nine, and Pau was going to have an eighth game, it was going to take an extraordinary fall off a cliff for him in the semi final, or for someone who I hadn't seen it from yet. In the in the other of the remaining other teams, to overtake him in my vote, but at the same time I didn't think he was going to win because almost invariably the 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 winner of MVP is from the winning team, or they may come from the team that gets silver runners up. We saw that with Dirk when he won it, obviously. I think this year is definitely one where it could happen. So I think it's got to be a finalist. I think this year it's entirely plausible a team that doesn't win Eurobasket has the MVP, but they've got to make the final. So bearing that in mind, if I look at sort of the way the brackets break, and that would be a Greece for starters. So naturally, it puts Giannis Antetokounmpo very, 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 very high in the conversation. I have Greece in my current bracket, which has changed my original bracket because I had, I'll get to that, uh, I've been going all through to the final against either Slovenia or Serbia, the way my bracket's going as well, uh, which we'll get to the who's going to win it all. Don't worry, that's one of my own personal questions. Um, so... Uh, that Slovenia, Serbia, I mean, it's kind of obvious that's Luka and Nikola. Uh, and uh, so you go to okay, the three obvious ones. But the outside contenders, as in if they make a run, so they, I don't think either of them can win it because I don't think they can make it to the final. But I think they could win my vote, which is something in its own right. You know, I do have an MVP vote, one of many, so it won't swing the balance. Franz Wagner from Germany. I don't think he can do it because unless Germany stun Greece, which I don't think is going to happen, uh, I and that's assuming they both get to meet in the quarterfinals obviously Franz could do it I think if Franz got to the semi-final the way he's playing and the level he'd need to play in the two games he's got before then I think he's a very good chance of winning an MVP vote I don't think that's plausible other side however for one of your potential semi-finalists although again unlikely because they'd probably have to get past Serbia in the process you look at what Laurie Markkinen is doing in terms of just pure hero ball and if Finland somehow found a way to get to the last four Again, yeah, it would be very hard to look over Laurie for my MVP vote. I don't think either Fr Franz or Laurie can win it again to the final, just to be clear. Um, but I think they could win my vote. 
But at the moment, I would say, in terms of likelihood of, of winning it, I'll go number one, Jan Santa de Campo, number two, Luka Doncic, and number three, Nikola Jokic. And so, how's my German from Mary Maguire? Uh, guten Abend, ich heiße Emma Drei. Ich komme aus Irland. Ich habe ein bisschen Deutsch, aber es ist nicht sehr gut. Ich liebe Basketball und ich brauche Eurobasket. I hope that's reasonable. Uh, but I've been doing it on Duolingo for the last three months. I've got to do my Duolingo after I finish this, actually. And uh, get my lesson in for the day just to keep the streak going. It's like a drug. But yeah, working on it. I did, did German up until I was 16 in school. I'm now 41. And I found over the years me traveling that I go to Spain, I'm the journalist of the word Spanish. I go to Italy, I'm the journalist of the word Italian. France, you name it, you know. Uh, your classic sort of countries that are near Ireland, basically. And you go, I go to Germany suddenly, and obviously excluding the people from German-speaking nations. Uh, suddenly, I'm the guy, everybody, all the other journalists are asking the pub to feck and do the talking because my then terrible, now slightly less terrible German is, um, you know, the best in the room, which is kind of worrying because I didn't even do very well in school. I got a C in what was we call a junior cert, which is... The exam I typically do when you're 15. I was in kind of a weird school where, because we were doing, well, it was a great school, but weird that we did it at 16 because back then it was, well, it still is an all Irish school. Back then, all Irish schools where you learn Oscoelga uh, had a habit of doing it four years to that first exam, basically get used to speaking Irish. And so I did German, German for four years in school, and somehow I kept more of it up than French, which I did for a total of, I think, would have been at least nine years of my education. I did far better in French than I ever did in German in school. And my French is terrible, like abysmal. Uh, and I didn't keep a word of it, very sad about that. Um, back to another question from Mary McGuire. What, Mary, by the way, used to be uh, the head of comms in Basketball Ireland and is a miracle worker for Irish basketball. One of the great, I would say unsung heroes, only everybody in Irish basketball will tell you how great Mary is. So she's not an unsung hero. She's a very rightly well-sung hero. Legends are spoken of her name. What team has impressed me the most? That's a tough one because obviously Greece have been perfect that I've seen in person and they've been very good. But I think impressing me the most has to be someone who's overachieved. And that makes it a bit more interesting. Uh, and if I'm going with that, I'm going to say Germany. Obviously there was the loss to Slovenia, but they fought them hard. And, um, you know, they got those tough, tough wins. Like the, big, the, the Lithuanian one, very controversial, don't get me wrong. But like that big win over France as well. So I'm, I'm going to say Germany purely because I don't think they're an obvious answer. Like I think the obvious answers are Serbia and Greece. I don't like being obvious. So there's that. Uh, how much have you been drinking? This is more like a ball in Europe question. That's from Phelan Makanumra. Uh, he's a good friend of mine in Ireland. And uh, Phelan, the short answer is nowhere near as much as I'd like to. So the problem at Milan geography wise is the arena for those of you who haven't been I know a lot of you watching this will have been to Saga Forum or Mediolanum Forum in Milan it's a really good bit out of town and by the time we're finished work after the late game it's already midnight the metro closes at 12.30 so you'd literally be getting into town if you're lucky as the metro has just stopped so that's guaranteed taxi home which is expensive most nights at the best of times but then like you know early nights like the non-weekend nights you know it's very hard to actually you know find a decent bar that's open uh or at least one that's open longer than one or two drinks and if you want to you know have a proper night after your basket you want to have more than one or two drinks that's one of the reasons much as i love milan i prefer berlin for the finals uh because i know drinking in the city very well i'm going drinking in the city not long after this video goes online uh and yeah that's that's i think the drinking this week and well, the weeks come, but including this weekend, even with the four game day, Saturday, Sunday, will be far more substantial than the drinking in Milan. And that it won't be close is the short answer. Um, the one that I haven't got, got from anybody, which I'm gonna answer now, and then it'll be one from me, which is more to answer and the FAQ of all of them, uh, is who do I think is gonna win it all? Right now, I am saying Greece, but to me, there are three teams which I would have at almost equal chances of gold. Uh, I've mentioned them already. They are Greece, Slovenia, Serbia. 
like to me there's slivers between them from what we've seen so far obviously different ways of you know when it getting to this stage even though they're all one seeds different calibers of groups is the big reason for that and they're doing what they should be doing given what they're playing which sounds awfully awfully sort of you know political as an answer but what i'm trying to say is like greece have had a couple of tough games but they've also shown they can brutalize teams serbia had a pretty easy run but they you know dealt with that easy run in a way a team that should do what an easy run does and slovenia obviously had some real big battles in that brutally brilliant uh, group b and so they've all done what i think they should be doing and uh, so i'm gonna go with that the last one is from me very much me so i often get asked why is an irish journalist into your european basketball like i'll get asked why i'm at the bcl final four or the Euroleague final four while i'm at the euro basket why i'm at the world cup uh, I never got asked when I'm at the Olympics because I don't like the idea of going to the Olympics as a journalist, to be honest. It's far more fun to watch it as a fan and uh, because you get to watch way more sports. And so I don't plan on ever covering the Olympics in person for basketball. Sorry about that, folks. And the reason is pretty simple. because it It's a lot of it to do with my age. And I don't mean sort of that I'm a middle-aged man. I mean literally when I was born. Uh, so when I was about 10 or 11, uh, we would have had like a pretty good setup at home as in we had all the talents you could get for free with cabling, as it was called then, which is the most basic, like 12, 14 channel cable service, if that even might even have been as low as nine at one stage because of a dispute. And pay TV took away all the football. And I was like, you know, a kid in school, I knew that football was the thing. And I was like, in Ireland, we used to have more football than the English even had to watch on TV at weekends because the English, and just going way back, I think with a sheer number of games in the Premier League shown every week, or whatever country you're in, in your league shown every week. In England, when I was 10, 11, they only showed 12 games a season on TV. Now, they were all on free TV, and I was in the league, and they showed FA Cup games as well, and obviously European games, but like your Sunday afternoon, the big match live, ITV. And if you're English, yeah. Here's the thing, if you're Irish, you got a game every Saturday live as well because we didn't have the restrictions the UK had around what you can show football-wise at 3 p.m. on a Saturday, because uh, basically you can't show it at 3 p.m. on a Saturday in the UK, any football at all, by the way, not even just English. Uh, famously, the, the Classico was once, El Classico was once uh, not able to be shown in full. They could only show it from the second half on because it clashed with the protected window, even though it wasn't taking place in the UK. So there's a bit of knowledge for you all. And so I was like, you know, sport mad kid, and. I, Bit of a nerd i know you're shocked i'm a bit of a nerd so channel 4 one of the uk channels had uh, trans world sports which is a magazine thing of all sorts of sport gazetta football italia this is all a saturday morning which was their italian football highlight show and they had a game every sunday live and they had nfl blitz which is how i got into american football which was you know because again it was the glamour the razzmatazz the crazy action look cool and so that got me to that but when the nfl season ended then channel 4 started showing an, an, an NBA magazine style show. And it wasn't just they were showing the NBA highlights, which was great, just to be clear, I loved the heck out of that. They were showing, you know, sort of the whole, the, the hip hop culture around it. And like me as a 12 year old, like, you know, pasty kid in Deliri, South Dublin, was kind of going, this is the coolest stuff I've ever seen in my freaking life. And so I was just, yeah, this, this stuff was cool. But that's NBA, that's like the logical route for most people to get into basketball. But uh, European is, uh, goes back to, I figure well, I'll watch whatever basketball I can because I like this sport. Eurosport was one of the channels we had in that basic package. And they showed Eurobasket in 1997. And so I just started watching it because I was figuring I got like live basketball every night. Like I remember a year or two prior, I think it was 94, Ireland won what is now the FIBA Small Countries for Men. It was then called the Promotions Cup. Um, there's a bit of knowledge bonus for you. I saw a final live on RTE2 and it was great. Ireland beat Cyprus. It was great. Yeah, Ireland won a European trophy. Brilliant. Uh, you know, I didn't totally get at the time how important it was. When we won it in 2021, I really got how important it was. Uh, you know, 40 year old Emmett got that over a lot better than 13 year old Emmett did, or maybe even 12, I'm not sure what age it was at the time. But um, anyway, Eurosport took the 97 Euro basket. I only realized it was even on, like the, it was like the uh, quarter final stage or the whatever, the end of the group stage. It was a few games that had already been played. I'm just watching, 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 watching. And absolutely swallowing this in there was like a FIBA weekly magazine that was like 30 minutes I was trying to catch in the euros probably to check the TV listings it was all pre-internet stuff 
And so it was like, right, grand. And I remember the next year, Basque came along and they didn't have it, but they had, they were showing the then European Cup slash Euro League, as it was called. I've forgotten what exactly it was. They took the final four of that. Like, what is now CNBC Europe had NBC Super Channel before that, which was NBC's attempt at a pan European entertainment channel. Again, there was a mix of uh, American football and basketball. So they showed all the Notre Dame home games, but then they show like March Madness games. Like, you know, I was kind of going, what? Uh, so I guess, you know, I saw like a, a Final Four, it would have been one of the mid-90s North Carolina teams or late-90s North Carolina teams that got to a, that won a championship actually, I saw their semi-final game because it was like on a reasonable hour Irish time and again, I didn't know, I was too young to cop the difference between the pro and the college, so it was all a bit sort of confusing for me, but I knew I was into it and so yeah, I just watched, watched, watched wherever I could. Through college, I kind of watched a lot less of it, like I stuck with the American football following that, but uh, just, you know, college happens, I still like basketball, but I just didn't watch as much of it. And just got back into it, oddly, when I got, a, got working, because uh, the idea of getting up for the NBA was not happening. Uh, staying up, sorry, because, you know, got a job in the morning. And, uh, you know, it was kind of normal, like, you used to really watch the European stuff. So, like, mid-2000s, late, 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 late end of the 90s or something like that. I figured, well, like, you know, wait, EuroLeague has a subscription, got that. Start getting a subscription to watch the following year basket from FIBA, you know, do that. And just I'm plugging, 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 and I get followed for the World Cup that Spain had won, and obviously would always watch basketball at the Olympics. Uh, that would be the 06 World Cup, the Spain one, and uh, you know, so I just got into it and just kept watching and just drinking it in. And I was writing a bit about it here and there. I was writing, so it was oddly the European interest coming back into writing in Ireland. Covered a couple of the cup finals. I did a couple of interviews. Rachel van der Waal, who I mentioned earlier, was one of my first interviews. Uh, isn't it mad? the most time the question I'm asking myself. For fuck's sake, out. Uh, and now we're going to get like struck for swearing uh, but anyway uh, and yeah so like that got me going and really enjoyed it and the opportunity to take over ball in Europe came up because Oz the previous uh, editor was moving back to the States at a time zones didn't work for him and I said this is a great idea great opportunity it happened to be closed in the middle of Europe as of 2013 which both of us realised at the time was a hilarious time to be trying to be closing a deal because of course it meant I was becoming editor for the stage after the opening group stage, which, oh wow, that was that was that was crazy. Uh, so you're sort of taking over Eurobasket as Eurobasket is boom 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 going, uh, which was kind of mad. I'm covering from like my living room in Dublin. Then uh, that was the first thing. It's like never doing a tournament from the living room again if I couldn't avoid it. And then yeah, went to the next uh, final four. I went to the World Cup. And been going to as much basketball as I can since, made lots of great friends. And it's one of the best things I've ever done for myself, for, me, for myself in my life. Not counting, of course, my girlfriend, and she's great. Uh, and oh, yeah, hi, Shabagi. Mwah, love you, because I know you're missing me being here in Germany. But you'll see me soon after I go to the US first. I'm doing a lot of traveling. Anyway, listen, I might do another one of these if you all want to ask me some questions. Fire some questions you want below in the comments. If you haven't, subscribe. I should have been telling you to subscribe earlier. I know, got to get on it. We do need to get the subs though. So if you're actually watching seriously and you haven't subbed yet, but you get subscribing there already because we get, you need to get to a thousand before we can earn any money off any of our videos. Uh, and we basically need to get a thousand subs because we have the hours. We've hit that requirement. We need to do a thousand subs. As you can, if you're looking at this, you can see we're below that now. Uh, so yeah, fire some questions below. I will interact with all of them. Uh, and yeah, listen, thank you all, and uh, choose.